the government has had to make put in some measures to to pull back at least temporarily mm. all right so from the anti-flipping situation the government does not want people speculating in the real estate market in the way that they would speculate on small cap stocks for example i'm going to buy this stock and i'm going to you know f- wait a couple months and then flip it for a profit right they don't want you to be able to do that i mean i don't know if you consider dj's to be a concert but i went to diplo in uh miami okay uh, okay at 11 yeah i don't know if you know anything about 11 no no i know about snoop dogg <laughs> snoop dogg's been done it done 11 a number of times oh has he yeah yeah okay okay you would love it if you're a man, you'll love it. Yeah? Yeah. I think I'm pretty manly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, okay. well, you're testing my manhood okay. on, on live podcast here. Fabio Campanella, Quentin Corder, what's going on, guys? Uh, great up, to brother? be here as always, man. All right. Cool. So listen, lots of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Taxes. Uh, we're doing assignment sales and condos, and I'm right. sure the government's been keeping you busy. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. This government, um, since their reign, reign of terror, let's call it. Yep. Uh has been keeping accountants and lawyers uh, and anybody else advising on taxation and law busy. That yeah. is for sure. That okay. is for sure. Yeah. So let's let's get into it then. So let's touch on the the difference in regards to when you're buying a condo, whether it's personal use or if it's going to be for rental. Right. right. So let's touch on that. Okay. Like, and what are the differences? Sure. So when you're buying a condo or any new build residential property for that matter, right? There's a big difference between moving into it as uh, a personal tenant for your personal use and buying a pre-construction property, residential property for the purpose of uh, renting it out or as an income property, Right. right? So I wanna distinguish, it's not necessarily a condo per se, although condos are very common um, it's a very common thing in Toronto and the GTA because we just don't have the space to build new homes, right? Yeah. But whenever you are purchasing on a pre-construction uh, contract, the right to purchase a property when it closes, right? And then you are going to move into it, there is a tax advantage to that, primarily from a GST, HST perspective, all right? You move into the property and there in the background, there is a GST, HST uh, credit that's roughly, let's say on average, about $25,000 that the builder applies in the background in your favor. Right. Okay. Yep. So the supply of a new construction residential property, whether a self-supply or a sale from a builder, and we can get into self-supply as well is considered a taxable supply from from the Excise Tax Act or from HST, GST perspective, mm. all right? Meaning that you have to, the builder has to charge HST to the end consumer of that product. Right. Okay. There are incentives for people moving in. Like I said before, you know, about $25,000 in terms of a credit. So if you buy a property and you're going to move into it, legally the the builder can make an application for a credit in the background on your behalf and reduce the price by in roughly about twenty five thousand dollars but are they reducing the price or not or is it not like just in that sticker price because the price actually doesn't get reduced yeah the sticker price that they're they're quoting yeah is often the sticker price of someone moving in right okay okay however if you are not moving into the property and instead you're buying the property in a corporation or in a partnership or in a JV or for a purpose other than moving into it personally, then what happens is you must pay the full HST, the full Mm -hmm. amount of HST. Right, on that sticker price. Yes, so it would increase the sticker price by roughly $25,000, let's say, just from a numerical perspective. Mm -hmm. Once you've purchased the property, all right, if you are able to put a long-term tenant in to that property, mm-hmm. then the government gives you an, an additional incentive. You can make an application in the background. Right. So, the, okay, hold on. So let's 
pull back then. So sure. before the tenant moves in, can you apply for that or do you actually have to have the tenant in place you first? You have to have the tenant in place. And then you can then. apply and then and you, that application is done through you an accountant or the lawyer. It, no, it's done through uh, anybody can do it. You can do it yourself. If oh, you okay, want. got it. it. Theoretically, you can do it yourself. Generally, people will hire their accountant to do it, mm -hmm. or there are some like um, specific companies that just do that, right? Yeah. And you make the application, and you get the the money back in a check. Okay. Right. So ultimately, the government, from a policy perspective, the easiest way to look at this is from a policy perspective. The government is ultimately looking for good quality housing for Canadians. Mm -hmm. And either you're moving into the property, you get the money back, or you're putting someone into the property long term, you get the money back, right? If you're going to Airbnb that property, for example, and just do short term rentals under 28 days, you're not going to get that money back. Right. Um, now, in regards to getting that money back, you're not getting it all back. Just the 25 grand. Just 25 grand. Yeah. Now, is that based on the price of the home or the yes. condo or the, okay. The fair market value of the property on closing. Okay. Now, um, in regards to now getting that tenant in, it has to be a long-term tenant. Correct. Okay, got it. And, and it's just the, on the investment side, is it just uh, just a percentage? Like you get 90% of it back or do you get the full pop it, as it's if you're moving a, in? A, a, I mean, it, it's a formula that I haven't memorized because it's in it, it's in the application, but for the most part, it taps out at a certain level, mm -hmm. right? Um, actually, the cheaper the home, the higher the percentage, but then after a certain level, it maxes out at about 24, 25 grand, something along those lines, right? No. right? Now, what about the anti-flipping tax, right? H how does this now play into this? Because a lot of times people are, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of investors thought that getting into the condo market, buying two or three condos and having zero interest in holding these properties. Correct. Now they're, they're, they're trying to flip it, but there's obviously some issues with that, with that new anti-flipping tax. Can we, can we dive into that? Sure. And, and I think that rather than just diving direct into the anti-flipping tax, I think... Mm -hmm putting this all into context is really important, all okay. right? Yep. You have this country, Canada, a vast, vast, vast land, and, and we're a rich country, but we're a growing country, yep. meaning that we need immigration, we need to increase our numbers. Um, it's very difficult to uh, encourage our current citizens to have a surplus of children, right? Uh, so, so affordable. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it's 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 also difficult. It's yeah. difficult, right? So you know, if you if you go back in history, you look at like uh, you know World War Two Germany and whatnot. There were incentives. They were incentivizing families to have five or more children, so on and so forth. We're not going to do that now. All yeah. right. So what do we do? We need immigration, and we want specific types of immigrants to come here that are going to benefit our society. Right. Okay, right. So when you have policies like this when you have interest rates that have been dropping for the most part over the long run what you are going to create is a situation where the housing market will boom over time and you're going to get rapid expansion in in residential real estate because there's the limited supply the long-term amount of time that it takes to create more supply and there's high demand both because of immigration and because of low interest rates right. right what that has done over the the past few decades it's it's created sort of this opportunistic um well an opportunity for savvy investors to really take advantage of that bull run that long-term bull run in real estate all right and it's created these sort of investors who are kind of circumventing what the government wants them to be actually doing. The government, believe it or not, wants you to buy a property, put a family in that property for a reasonable amount of rent, make a reasonable amount of profit, and then get a tax incentive when you sell it down the road. The government wants you to do that because it provides safe and quality Wants housing. or wanted. I, I, th I still think they do want you 
to do that. Really? It doesn't, I, I it doesn't feel think, like that, but okay. It doesn't feel like it, but I think that they still want you to do that. The problem is that the policies that have been in place have allowed so much quote unquote abuse of the system that they've had to rain down on on the party right now. Right. Okay, okay. I see what you're saying. So almost pull back the reins on some of the on the newer or smaller kind of ma and pa type of investors saying, okay, hold on a second. We we open up the floodgates a little too much. Right. right. Let's push them back out and uh, and allow for the more savvy, sophisticated investors to continue to still play in that sandbox. Because it was getting crowded. It, it was getting crowded and it was getting abused. One hundred percent. And, and yeah. once again, guys, I, I'm not. You, you, I've known you for a long time, right? I hate all governments. Yeah. Not just the current one. Right. Right. So I hate them all equally. I'm going to hate whoever comes next as well. And hate in the sense that I'm going to complain about them. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So the the idea here, though, is that because of this rampant sort of abuse of the system and abuse of this bull run in real estate, all right. The government has had to make put in some measures to to pull back, at least temporarily. Mm. All right. So from the anti-flipping situation, the government does not want people speculating in the real estate market in the way that they would speculate on small cap stocks. For example, I'm going to buy this stock and I'm going to you know f- wait a couple months and then flip it for a profit. Right. They don't want you to be able to do that. Prior to the introduction of the anti flipping rules in 2022, Mm -hmm. it was very difficult for the government to attack you uh, in in the sense that, you know, you were you were implementing this type of a strategy. All right. So to give you a background on the taxation of all this. All right. When you buy a piece of property. It's considered a capital investment, right? Or a capital property in your hands. Then when you sell it at a profit, you will claim a capital gain. Up until the end of this month, that capital gain had an inclusion rate on your tax return of 50%, meaning that you were paying tax at half the normal rate that you would pay on a different investment return, like, you know, interest on a mortgage or whatever. Okay. Yep. This gave savvy investors the incentive to use capital property as though it were actually inventory. Okay. Okay. Like inventory of a business. And they would do these quick uh, fix and flips or they would buy properties pre-construction and they would buy large numbers of these properties and they were connected with the builders, get them for a good price because they came in very early early, and then they would assign these properties very quickly at a profit the government had very few tools in their toolkit to attack this because people are like hey it's a piece of capital property right and the government would have to go to you know cra guidance and case law to prove that it was not capital property but instead was a piece of inventory that you are trying to flip for a profit and say, hey, listen, you don't get the capital gains inclusion of 50%. It's full business income inclusion. And that would, in effect, double your tax rate. Right. Okay. Yeah, because now you're getting taxed. Hold on, sorry. You're getting taxed as active income as opposed to capital gains. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yep. As business or active income, however you want to yep. yep. specify at, at, at your marginal tax rate. Exactly. So in, in Ontario, for example, the top marginal tax rate is 53.53% mm-hmm. rather than the capital gains rate, which was historically 26 and a half ish percent. Okay. All right. Yep big difference especially when you're doing this year over year over year over year and a lot of real estate agents builders and and savvy real estate investors were doing this over and over and over again in addition to this they were also taking advantage of the principal residence exemption all right okay so the principal residence exemption allows somebody to live in a house allow it to appreciate, and then sell it tax-free. That exemption is a good policy from the government's perspective because it allows for the mobility of the population in Canada. You get a job, a better job, a better opportunity for your family 50 kilometers away from your current 
uh, place of residence, move. And you don't have to worry about paying tax on the gain on your property, mm -hmm. right? The combination of these two things allowed um, savvy capitalists to sort of, you know, circumvent the rules or take take advantage of these these well-known loopholes. So people would buy a piece of property, significantly renovate it, pretend to live in it, and then flip it for a profit, claiming not only that it was a capital property, but it was also their principal residence, all right? Paying zero tax. And people do this over and over and over and over again. And the government said, okay, enough, enough with this, right? They started the process in 2016 with the reporting, the mandatory reporting of the sale or disposition of a principal residence. And you find this on uh, form T2091 and schedule three of a person's individual tax return. Right. Prior to that time, there was no requirement to report the sale of your uh, principal residence. Why? Because it was redundant. You're not gonna pay tax, so what's the point? What's the point of the CRA having this additional administrative burden? but they started gathering that data in 2016, moving forward. Right. All right. They, they supplemented that with the anti-flipping rule in 2022. So the anti-flipping rule broadly states, listen, if you buy a property and you flip it or sell it within 365 days, automatically under legislation, it is no longer a capital gain. It is business income. It has to be business right. income. Right. So they've been planning this for a few years, it's kind of like almost like layering it. And then once they had the, the data that they collected, now they can now implement that whole anti-flipping tax. We so, can speculate that right. that's what, what and, and it sounds very logical. Like it, it's a logical conclusion. Right. They were able to gather the data and they were able to put those two together. But they're not, the anti-flipping rule was not just for the principal residence exemption, right? It was for the capital gains treatment in particular, right? Or, or generally, because people were buying and flipping properties over and over and over again. And the government had very few tools, like I said before, to attack that. Now they have that tool. Right. Right. So, so this, so, yeah, sorry, prior to that, Fabio, couldn't the CRA, going back to the 2016 example, if they saw, if I did that four years in a row on four different properties, couldn't they come back to me and say, we can prove your intent was now to make a profit. So we're going to backdate and come at you for those uh, taxes, capital gains. Theoretically, yes. Right. But from a practical perspective, that's a very, Too very much difficult. Like they, they would need to uh, amass a, a, a large team of highly qualified individuals to scan through the data, which they didn't have right. at the time necessarily, and then attack people, right? Mm -hmm. And then these people aren't just going to sit back and say, oh, you caught me. Here's the check. Yeah. They're going to fight it, right. right? It's a very expensive endeavor and time consuming endeavor. It is much easier for the government to simply change the legislation and change the way that you have to report things, right? right? Mm -hmm. Now they have the data instantaneously because you've voluntarily given them the data or not voluntarily, you've been forced to give them the data, right. okay? Right. So no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No. So I'm going to kind of pull it back a little bit, unless you want to finish that off. Cause I want to kind of get in, like into the, the assignment of sales because now with everything that's happened with where the market was easy to get into interest rates were low interest rates now have, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word skyrocketed, but it's definitely gone up significantly. And now you have a bunch of investors who may not have been as savvy, maybe some of them are in there that have been and have got these condos and now they're sitting on it. And now they want to just get rid of it because they're like, I just wanted to flip this piece of paper, make some money. Let's touch on assignment of sales, how that works, and um, and, and what, what are your kind of thoughts on, on, on where we are in the market? Sure. When it comes to the assignment of a pre-construction condo or the assignment of a pre-construction property at all, all yep. right. The flipping rules apply to that as well. Okay. So it, it's very clear when you read the, the, CR, the government of Canada's guidance that the anti-flipping rules apply to a property that exists or a contract that allows you to purchase a property down the road in the future, AKA um, a pre-construction contract that sometimes it's referred to as, mm -hmm. right? Flipping 
a a or or s signing a uh, pre-construction contract and then uh, assigning it to someone else at a profit or or at a loss for that matter yeah. within a 12-month period is considered a property flip okay and must be addressed uh in that particular manner as business income now one of the key f the key pieces of this legislation is that it must be assigned as business income but if there's a loss it's denied oh really <laughs> yes yes okay <laughs> okay which is what a lot of people are in right now. Oh. If if they bought what I would say, probably 2020, 2021, 2021 for sure, yeah, and, and yeah. onwards. Even, yeah, even even twenty nineteen, twenty twenty mm -hmm. might be borderline. I, I feel that um, with the assignments, because it usually takes a number of years um, for in between the time you enter into the contract and actually close on the property. Um, I don't think that the flipping rule is going to really um, pertain to too many of these people. However, it could. In what sense? What do you mean? You know, so you, if you, I, you if sign I, a contract yeah. like four years ago and then, you know, you the property, you know, delays this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. The property is usually not built and you're usually not, you know, worried about closing on it until six months beforehand I, i'm speculating yeah. right you guys might be in a better position no there's a lot of people right now in yeah. pain there's a lot fabio i'm getting phone calls like weekly okay. like hey, i got this condo i bought it back in 2020 2021 yeah. it's now 100 to 250 less i've even heard of like 500,000 less it's wild right. and, and that's yeah. sort of the point that i was trying to make it's not like they bought the condo 11 months ago and they're like damn i gotta get out of it now Correct. yeah can right. you clarify that yeah. for us fabio so from the government's perspective is it the date we sign that contract with the builder or the date that it's officially closed and now there, we're a property yeah. owner there's two dates right it's the date you you enter into the contract mm -hmm. and then the the clock resets when you close there's also an occupancy date as well too you don't own not? the property though okay okay but you take over some payments you're taking over payments, but you don't own the property. You right. still only own the contract. So that's right? part of phase one, basically. Yeah. Is what so there's saying. there's two dates. As I read the guidance, mm -hmm. my understanding is there's two dates. It's the day you sign the contract, all right, and you have the right to purchase the property. And then when you close on the property, they restart the clock. Because that's another great time to sell the property. And technically, you are still... A property flipper even though you've held the contract for four years as soon as it hits the market you put it up on up for sale you had no intention to ever rent that place out and you never had any intention to uh, according to the government to move into it so let's let's pull back a little bit okay so now I buy this condo we're, we're, we're gonna go through the scenario of it is profitable so mm -hmm. I bought the condo 2018 it's now ready it is now you know uh, whatever June 2024 it's gone up 200,000 um, and I want to assign it. Mm -hmm. What are the tax implications there? Yeah, so in a situation like that, you don't necessarily fall under the flipping rules per se. Really? But like if, if more than 12 months have extended, right? However, that doesn't mean you're out of the, out of the gate because we still go to the old, to the old rules, right? That still exist. If intention Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bunch, bunch of different factors that, that come into play. There's your intention. How, how sophisticated was your financing? Were you doing this in conjunction with other people, like partners? What's your job? Are you a realtor? Are you a developer yourself? So a lot of factors come into play. And if the, if the government or the CRA comes in and says, hey, listen, you assigned this property, but you didn't assign it because, you know, hey, you know, I... I my situation changed, my spouse died, or I had twins, or my aging mother moved in with me, blah, 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 blah. You know, it wasn't, you didn't happen to have to sell it. You intended to buy it and sell it for a profit. They can still come in and say, this is business income and not, and not, um, 
right so before even right so before i even close on it that could be active income if i made that profit i sell this piece of paper to quinton and i got two hundred thousand now in my pocket that is now potentially active income tax at my marginal rate a hundred percent correct a hundred percent correct so once again these rules have always existed the anti-flipping rule just draws a line in the sand saying listen you do it in in 12 months it's automatically business business income, not capital gain, unless you meet one of these exemptions. You know, and when you say twelve months, you're talking about now. If I close on it and now I own it, that's your twelve months you're talking about. No, no. If you sign the contract and sign it within twelve months, business income. Okay, so this thing takes four years. So that, that's to, what I'm saying. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's, so, that's so my original saying, point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if if you assign, you bought in 2018, and now you assign it in 2023, you're right. fine. Right. Well, you're fine from from the anti flipping, right? But Correct. then you've got to go to the regular to the yes. regular guidelines, right? Was your intention to assign it in the first place or to make a profit off this in the first place? Once again, that's not what the government wants you to do. The government doesn't want you to treat this stuff like a piece of inventory at a store, mm-hmm. right? They don't want you going up and scooping up properties, right? Creating artificial demand and then flipping the properties thereby busting up um, uh, real estate prices artificially and creating a a situation where we have a housing crisis, right? Because affordability goes down. They want you to say, hey, I've got 20% to put down on a property. I can qualify for the mortgage and I'm going to charge a reasonable amount of rent to someone who's gonna be there for the long term, who's gonna be working and contributing to our society, right? They don't want you speculating on property. Got it. Okay. Yep. Okay. So then now I want to kind of circle back on something that you said in regards to it's a loss because there's a lot of now investors that are actually seeing this loss right now. You can't write that loss off at all. That that loss is denied. So it, and it's it's very clear that the loss that the loss is denied. All right. Once again, they don't want you flipping property. But besides besides that, because I don't think that's the biggest issue at play when it comes to assignments, um, the biggest issue at play that really freaks people out on top of the tax, which is already high, which could be 50%, mm-hmm. people forget about the HST. And often accountants and lawyers will forget about the HST. Right. Okay. And I think that's really like the hidden tumor that's going to metastasize across society here when people um, start flipping these properties. So when you assign a property, whether you're you're hit with the anti-flipping rules or not, or the business income or, or not, you have to worry about HST. And you're talking about when you go into the lawyer to sign the papers at that point, because a lot of times too. okay, well, that's that's another point as well, too. A lot of times people end up at the lawyer's office and they've got to calculate that. Okay, well, here's my down payment based on the price of the home. And all of a sudden they got to pay this HST bill that they didn't extra 25 grand. Right. They're not going to move into it. Right. Okay. so what's the other one now that you're talking about? All right. So now. Well, wait, there's more. Jimmy (laughs) buys a pre-construction condo yeah okay yeah and uh for let's just use round numbers 100 grand Mm -hmm. okay this property over the next four years goes up in value but he hasn't closed on it yet maybe it's six months out from closing jimmy assigns that prop that that contract and somebody pays him his his down payment back Mm -hmm. plus an additional one hundred thousand dollar assignment fee to compensate for the fact that the condo has gone up in value. Guess what? That profit of $100,000, Jimmy's got to Jimmy's got to back out HST from that and remit that 13 grand to the government. Right. Okay. You are basically considered a builder when you assign a pre-construction condo or a pre-construction property. Ah, and that's then, I didn't know that. Yeah. Did you? I don't not, think I no, knew not, that. Not that you were considered a you're basically considered a builder, yeah. right? Right. So you pay the HST, and then on top of that, then you're also paying tax on the profit. Tax on the profit, net of the active, HST. 
active potentially yes. yeah yeah potentially active but l- what you're referring to fabio sometimes that slips through the cracks so they sold the the sold the the condo they they went on the vacation they bought the car <laughs> yeah. and then six months later <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Here's the exactly. payment due. Now. Exactly. <laughs> so to further this, to make this even worse, all right, let's say you buy a property and you strip it down to the studs and renovate it to make it something, you know, it's a very common strategy and a very legitimate investment strategy. You you take a, a single family home, strip it down to the studs, make a, a really sick duplex and increase the the rent by, by doing that. If you have substantially renovated the property, by definition, that's 90% or more of the internal living space mm-hmm. renovated. You are deemed to have sold the property at fair market value once it's complete to yourself and you must self-assess HST on the fair market value of the property. How do you do that? What do you mean self-assess? Uh, get an appraiser? Yeah, or? you got an appraisal. Yeah. You bought the property for half a million bucks, yeah. put a couple hundred grand into it. Now it's worth a million bucks. You owe $130,000 of HST. Hmm. Okay. This is often missed by investors. And there are investors out there who have done this 10, 20 times. Who knows how many times they've done that. They've had no idea... And they have no idea that they may have a huge liability to the to the government should they be audited, right? So I guess the the overall point I'm trying to make here is when it comes to assignment of a property or treat or building and renovating a property, you really got to get your ducks in line. Like you can't just go out and do it without first understanding the rules. And your accountant might not even know the rules right your lawyer yeah. might not even know the rules i don't think i even i don't think i knew that so then so so you got to pay that hst based on what you bought it for what it you increased the value to outside of even what you sell it for well when you when you you're you're deemed to have sold it at fair market value to yourself it's a deemed disposition and reacquisition essentially from an HST perspective. All At right? what point? You're talking about when you refinance? No, no. When when it's completed. When the pro- when when you build a property and it's completed. So mm-hmm. whether you build do a new build and it's completed or a, or a substantial renovation and it's completed. Right? right? It's basically sold to yourself. You're the buyer and the seller at fair market value, whatever the appraised value of the property is. And HST is due on that. And that appraised value is only for HST because Correct. obviously when you want to sell it later on, yeah, capital yeah. gains is going to be back to your right. original purchase price. Original purchase price and, it was, the and then what you sell it for. Right. There's all kinds yeah. of taxes in right. that. That's crazy. Right. So right. You, you do have to be careful. It doesn't mean that it's not advisable to do this. Right. But in your original cash flow, you've, you've got to factor in all of these things. Right. Yeah, yeah. So property flipping could still be a very profitable endeavor. Right. But just run it like a business. Don't treat it like a, a capital gain. Like do the calculations correctly is what I'm saying. Do you find, though, or do you know there's probably like a lot of investors that are just doing their taxes they're on their own and they're not even paying attention to all this stuff? Nobody's paying attention to this stuff. <laughs> Who's paying attention <laughs> Who's to this? Who's reading why tax would you, law? Who the, who, who, why yeah. on earth would you pay attention to this stuff? It's the most lame, boring subject that you could possibly think of. And investors are not considering necessarily tax in their investments all the time. Like theoretically, like you know, when you take investment courses in university or whatnot, theoretically, the investor is um, looking at the after-tax returns always. But they're not, is what I find from an anecdotal perspective, having dealt with thousands of investors in my life, right? Um, I find that people are just looking at the top line. What's my ROI? What's my gross ROI? They're not looking at the net ROI, net after tax. Mm -hmm. That's what impresses them, right? The gross ROI. So if I come to you and I say, hey, listen, I've got this particular... um, 
fund, this, let's call it a mortgage fund, all right? And you've got a million dollars of assets ready to deploy into investments in a taxable account, all right? So ignore TFSAs, ignore RRSPs, whatever. Yep. And I say, listen, I've got this, this uh, fund that has historically over the last 10, 15, 20 years done a 10% ROI year over year over year without missing a beat. Mm-hmm. Looks pretty freaking good. Or I've got this other structure that is a tax shelter that gives you 6.5% year over year over year over year. People are just looking at the gross. They're looking at the 10% ROI, right? And imagine all things were equal. Now, if you're paying tax at the, on the margin at 53.53% and you reverse engineer the 6.5% uh, investment that is tax sheltered, it's actually higher of a rate of return than the 10%. That's 15 grand a month, uh, 1500 a month difference. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it's yeah, a big yeah, difference. Yeah. But but people are fixated on the top line ROI and that's not how you have to do your your investment analysis. You have to consider everything. So when you are doing an investment analysis for a piece of real estate, once again a, a flip may be a great uh, strategy for you. It may be a, a, the perfect strategy. Just consider the taxes all the way to the end, mm-hmm. right? So we recap it, right? If you're selling, buying and selling within 12 months, it's business income for sure, mm-hmm. okay? If there's a loss, it's denied, right? But nobody's getting in on this stuff to take a loss. They're getting on it to, to make a perceived gain, all right? right? Within 12 months, you have no choice. It's a flip, all right? If it extends past 12 months, then intention has to be proved to make it a flip. Right. All right. It could be a capital gain. Right. What other issues are you seeing with investors coming to you specifically to condos? Like, are you seeing where you've got a lot of investors and they've got like a few condos that they that they purchased and they thought they're going to make a big profit and now they're in some difficulties? Well, being realistic, you know, I don't have the the, the statistics in front of me, but yep. you know, the cap rates on condos, and especially in the GTA, are not ultra impressive, at least you know, in the resale market, right? Or for people that are buying pre-construction condos, um, and they're not getting some sort of a deal on it. So, like, just the general population, you go out there and you buy a condo, you put a tenant in, you're, you know. You probably have to put what maybe like a 35 percent down payment to really guarantee yourself a positive cash flow i'd probably even say higher than that maybe even higher yeah right i'm seeing right now some of these mortgage payments are like five six seven thousand and you're talking like you know condos that are like six hundred to eight hundred thousand and you're not renting them out for anywhere near that maybe three thousand maybe thirty five hundred at 20 percent down so yeah you're probably getting into yeah you're right maybe 35 like 40 40 percent yeah percent right yeah, it, yeah. I, I feel would be just pulling a number out of out of a mm-hmm. hat I, I feel like 30 to 40 percent is what you would have to be putting down right? yeah which significantly impacts your long-term rate of return on these things yep yeah. right so the the whole point of real estate at least in my opinion of directly investing in real estate um is i i need to get i need to have my cash flows covered for sure Plus, I need a little bit of a safety net, maybe a couple hundred bucks a month for sure, for sure. Because, you know, the toilet's going to go or this is going to go or that's going to go or I'm going to lose a tenant for a month or two and whatever it is. Right. Yep. So what what I'm seeing with condos is, you know, with the general population trying to invest in condos, they're, they're getting in on the market a little bit late in my opinion, and they're just unsophisticated. And that's why they're getting into condos rather than, you know, some other type of a strategy because it's easy. Uh Buy a condo, it's a one bedroom, you're dealing with one tenant, you put someone in, ah, yeah, I'm down 500 bucks a month, 600 bucks a month, but I'm going to own this thing um, down the road and it's going to be paid off. Right, yeah. right. 15, 20 years from now. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I always tell people, I say, listen, you know, you buy a piece of property and let's say over a 20, 25 year period, you just break even from a cash flow perspective. One year you're down, one year you're up, so on and so forth. Let's say that property doesn't increase in value at all. All right. Not even, not even a penny. You've actually five extra money 
because you paid off the mortgage and you put 20% down, right? Yep. Those days are, right now are a little bit over because you can't put 20% down and expect to break even over time, right? But theoretically you could. Now let's say that condo doubles in value over a 25 year period, which is not an unreasonable expectation. 20% yeah, so down, break even, double in value, that's a 10X yep. on your money, right? So people are looking at it like that and, and they, they think that they can still do this. Whereas I don't think that's where um, the sophisticated money is going. So when I look at my client base, which is, you know, five, 600 families, right? The smart money isn't going into that necessarily, right? Unless they're scooping up deals where people are desperate, they're buying assignments. Which is what you're starting to see right now. I'm starting to see that. I have I've, yeah. I've, I have like a, a number of realtor and realtor families and realtor groups that are I advise. And some of the really sophisticated ones are bulk bulk selling and bulk buying um, these, these uh, condo, these pre-construction condos at bargain basement prices off desperate people. Yes, yeah, so, I'm, I'm seeing that as well. Yeah. So there's probably opportunity there, mm -hmm. but that's opportunity for people with excellent credit, excellent access to leverage, and excellent cash flow. Because you know, there's always that period of time where the condo closes and you know, the 75 units hit the market, and so it's hard to find a good quality tenant, mm -hmm. right? So you've got to be able to float that. But what I'm starting to see with smart money. I'm starting to see people focusing on um, repurposing single family homes or lots that would be normally for single family homes into multi uh, multi door units. Yeah, we're doing that, a lot of that right that's now. That's where I'm seeing the, a lot of the smart money. And then obviously then I have my ultra high net worth clientele are, are still, you know, they're looking at apartments and they're moving over to Florida for certain types of uh, properties or even other places in the States, um, not necessarily just Florida. Florida is common for Canadians, right? But yep. they're looking elsewhere. Yep. They're, they're not looking at these one door, one tenant type of properties. Yeah, they're looking more like at the 10, 20, 50 units, 100 units, right? Outside yeah, of yeah, I would say like uh, uh, they're looking at larger, larger unit sizes. Even like something, something like a, a five plex yeah. or a ten plex. Even in let's say you know out on the outskirts of the city, somewhere in the Hamilton, St. Catharines area, or out on this side uh, as well, people are looking. And that's where I'm seeing like a lot of the smart money going, at yeah. least at the level that I'm dealing with. Yeah. Right, the level I'm dealing with is really you know people with a net worth usually somewhere between one and. Twenty-five million dollars, yeah. right? Not not like people, two hundred million dollars. Well, I think also too, Fab. If you follow kind of like what we've done over the years, we've mm -hmm. always been moving east, right? We were in Durham, then we moved out into Curtis and Bowmanville, and went out to Peterborough. For the first time, we've actually now moved our clients into Toronto. We've never done anything in Toronto, and we started doing that last year because of uh, Bill Twenty Three where now you can take a single family home and convert it into a four or five unit. Right. That now makes sense, right? right? And understand that converting into, um, I believe the limit is four or five units. Don't yeah. quote me on this, but. Depending if, yeah. if you have a lane way in the back or whatever. Yeah, so yep. if you if you renovate or build um, a four or five unit, let's just say five to be safe. I don't have the rules in front of me. Um, there's an exemption on the HST self-assessment. Okay, so there's incentive to build density. There's an incentive now for the government wants high quality, safe homes with density. That's what they're looking for, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. So I think that's the opportunity from a pure investment perspective. Yeah, yeah, and they gave breaks for those type of conversions on development fees too. Right, and, right. and you guys are much more familiar with that. Yeah. I'm just kind of looking yeah. at it from the bird's eye view, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you do have money, if you are looking to, to get into the real estate sector, I think from all different types of perspectives, you're looking at a benefit to density. Yeah. Anything else on condos before we wrap it up? No, just, you know, wish the best for the people out there that are in hot water. Yeah. And um, that's it. 
I guess one last question you might know this is like do you, is what's the assignment fee or sorry do do all condos like the builders do they allow um, assignments it, do you it's, know it's builder specific right yeah. so it depends on the builder some of them advertise it's a marketing ploy too right yeah. free assignments or only 5000 assignment fee so mm-hmm. it's an attractive marketing tool that the builders use but uh, yep. some of them won't right some yeah. of them like no we're going to control this inventory yeah anything else Fabio, before we wrap it up on this particular topic and condos and assignments and well, what I'm going to do is I'm, uh, I'm going to do two things yep. um, for the listeners. Uh, I have uh, all the topics that we spoke about here, and I've actually created a blog a blog post on my website, okay, specifically for this, where we get into details and I provide links to the CRA guidance so that they can make informed decisions themselves. Also, following this podcast, probably I'll coincide it when for when the podcast comes out, I will put together a five or 10 minute detailed YouTube video specifically on these topics to explain it in a summarized fashion. Perfect. Yeah. Same thing, description. Uh, in the description, I'll put links to the guidance that I'm using with the CRA All right. and with the government. So then we'll put some of those links in the show notes as well too. Sure. Beautiful. Perfect. All right, Fabio, thank you very much. Appreciate your time, Quentin. Thanks for uh, co-hosting with me, and we'll do this again, brother. For sure. All right. right. Thanks, guys.